USA Warrior Stories is a not-for-profit organization designed to record, archive, and share videos of veteran stories to help veterans make a connection with one another and to help us all better understand their sacrifices for our freedoms. I was born and raised just, out, just outside of D.C. Uh, in Maryland. My mom and dad had come there for work, like most kids who grow up in the D.C. area. Mom was a lawyer. Dad worked for the government. My dad had been a Marine in Vietnam. So I grew up being pretty inclined towards service. When I got into my teenage years, that turned a little bit into aimless, you know, troublemaking kid. But 9-11 happened my junior year. But by noon on September 11th, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and, and where I wanted to go. So my plan was to enlist in, in the Marines, and uh, I, I was going to miss my high school graduation to do it. Uh, the Iraq War was just starting at that point in the spring of 2003, and I really felt like, man, I, I, would, I need to go right now. And the recruiter was on his way to my house. But my dad pulled me aside, and my dad had dropped out of Dartmouth College to enlist in the Marines in 1967. So he pulls me aside and says, look, I know how you feel. I, obviously, I know how you feel, because I did it. But when I got there, I was Lance Corporal Smith. And that meant that I had to take orders from some leaders who weren't very good at their jobs or didn't care very much about Lance Corporals like me, or, or sometimes both. And it got some guys killed, and it got me hurt pretty bad. And if you have the ability to do a better job than those guys did, which I think you might, don't you owe it? to the core to exercise a little bit of patience here and go get your education, which the Marine Corps will give you, so that you can be one of those leaders who's taken better care of guys than, than I got. And that really had a big effect on me, so I said, uh, okay. So off I went down here to New Orleans. I came here to participate in the ROTC program, fell in love with the city. Um, it took two years to get the ROTC scholarship uh, I, w I did not have the most stellar disciplinary record in high school, and the Marine Corps wasn't crazy about it until the Iraq War really got big, and I think they were, they were hurting for manpower a little bit, so they, they said to guys like me, okay, we'll let you in now. So uh, I graduated in 2008, delayed a little bit by Hurricane Katrina, uh, and went straight on active duty. I, I had signed up really just dead set on wanting to be in the infantry and wanting to be in the fight. Pursued that and got it, so I went from the infantry officers course in the beginning of 2009 straight to 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines at uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Boy, that was a wild, wild ride. You know, in 2009, the Marine Corps had been at war for the better part of a decade. So your senior guys had already seen quite a lot of combat and quite a lot of deployments, quite a lot of strain on their families and themselves. And then you had younger guys like us just showing up kind of wide-eyed like, here we go, here's the real deal. So things were, were pretty dynamic working in an infantry company in 2009. You know, I've never been a part of something that felt that special in that way, that, that we had been called upon to do this, what really ended up being a historic thing uh, in the history of Marine Corps battles. In January 2010, Marja was a town caught in the grip of insurgent control. Under Taliban rule, bazaars were nearly empty. Residents had no freedom of movement, and the economy was a narcotics-producing machine. Children weren't even allowed to go to school. Marja was a sort of artificial oasis created out in the desert by USAID in the 50s. A big canal was dug off of a river and looped around itself kind of like a noose, so water could flow around it, and then inside of the noose was this grid of irrigation canals to create this fertile farming area which made it really perfect for growing poppy. It also made it exceptionally defensible because it was a city with a big moat around it. And there was only one place to cross in from the north side. They just blanketed it with IEDs from one end to the other. IEDs you step on, IEDs that get set off, every kind of thing imaginable. And so they sent the, the best EOD Marines they had to take on this threat, E.J. Pate and Johnny Morris. And these two were assigned to us because they were just about the best EOD team in the Marine Corps. And on the first day of that fight, when we crossed into the city, those two Marines probably pulled 48 or 50 IEDs out of the ground in about four hours, with a company-on-company -company firefight going on all around them. Counterinsurgency, as it was done at the time, was done in three phases. Clear, hold, build. 
you clear out the enemy, you hold the terrain, you stabilize things, and then you build infrastructure for the civilian population. And in 2010, it was nothing but clear. It was a, I heard that deployment described once as a knife fight in a phone booth. That was pretty accurate. What was the proudest thing in my life until my daughter was born was the fact that on February 13, 2010, 78 Marines and 3rd Platoon crossed into the city of Marja. And eight months later, all 78 of those Marines came home. Some came home a little bit early and a little bit banged up, but they all came home. And every single one of those guys, including me, uh, owed their lives to E.J. Pate and Johnny Morris. The following year, we went back to Marja, which meant that my Marines got to come back in 2011 and go back to their old patrol base, which was called the Yellow Schoolhouse. It had been a school, and we had pushed the Taliban out and took it over, and we fought out of there every day. I mean, you'd get woken up in the middle of the night shooting out the window. And when we came back a year later, there were 40 kids going to school there. And EJ and Johnny went to Sangin. And Sangin by then was the new Alamo of the Taliban. And it had really become, Marines were just getting chewed to pieces. And on June 26, 2011, the year after we were together, a Marine had stepped on a landmine. EJ stabilized that casualty and saved that kid's life. Then proceeded to work to clear out a landing zone so this kid could be medevaced. And in the process of doing so, looked over a wall spotted an, another device and saw it and turned to somebody to say there's another device over here and it went off. I wear them on my wrist every day. I didn't reach retirement. I got out after eight years. And I remember some folks saying when I did, you know, they're like, man, you're only 12 years away from retirement. And I was like, that's 12 years. Like I've done eight and it feels like 80 sometimes, you know, certainly physically. So I got out and I felt pretty good about it. You know, I had gotten to do everything that I wanted to do. I had great timing in the Marine Corps. I showed up to every unit right as something great was happening and I got to take part. I really wanted to be back here. So I got out and I came back and I had the GI Bill to take me back to Tulane for law school. You know, I had everything that you would want to have for a successful transition. But I will remember for the rest of my life, standing in line at Zara's supermarket and the lady asked me, I'd, I had moved back here about three or four weeks prior, and she's making small talk. And she goes, what do you do for a living? And I went, I'm a, m and I got to the M in Marine before I realized that's not true anymore. You know, I, I am a Marine. I'll always have that in my heart, but it's not on my shirt anymore. I am not Captain Jackson Smith, United States Marine Corps anymore. And so I have to establish this new identity for myself. And I found that process very difficult, very difficult. I just kept coming back to this idea of, you know, I used to have a mission. I used to have a calling. I was a Marine. That's not a job. Uh, and now I have a job. And the job that I have, it doesn't seem to be doing anything for all of this kind of uh, Un instability that's developing around me. And that disconnect between what I was doing professionally and what I thought ought to be done to serve my community and the people around me really was really hard. So I went home and I asked my wife and my six month old first daughter what they thought about an abrupt total change in career with completely different financial implications and all the rest. And, uh, and they both gave their blessing. The story of Bastion is really integral to and inseparable from the story of New Orleans, especially since Hurricane Katrina. So if you guys look back this way, right to the right side of that two-story yellow house that you see there, Excuse me. during Katrina, levees broke in two places. One of them was right there. So we are standing right now at the literal ground zero of the Katrina flood. This was an apartment complex that was completely devastated. And my predecessor, our founder, had just gotten out of the army after participating in the initial invasion of Iraq. Comes back to New Orleans in the summer of 2005, planning to start a new career. Katrina happens immediately. So now he's engaged in all of this reconstruction work. And he's looking at people who have lost everything. In spite of all of that devastation and loss, these people are finding ways to reach out to one another. And meanwhile, he starts losing friends, friends from the Army. And so as these veteran mental health issues and crises start to bubble up, 
in 2005. He looks around at what's going on in New Orleans and he says there has to be a way to take these two dots and connect them. Bastion is the first intentional living community for disabled veterans and their families anywhere in the country. All of these homes are built in sets of four facing each other. A pair of two facing a pair of two. The reason why this place was built this way is these sets of front porches form this sort of de facto sewing circle outside of your house such that when you come in and out in the mornings and in, in, in the evenings, you're going to socialize, whether you like it or not. Hey, Mr. Yo, Anthony, how, you doing, how are you, my friend? How are you? All right. <laughs> so these three gentlemen here, three of my bosses, this is a great sort of cross-section of leadership within our community because we have here. Marine, Army, Air Force. That's right. That's right. I would have just kept with Marine. We don't need to yeah. talk about the other two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Anthony is a Bastion ambassador. Joe uh, it works in our programs as well as an ambassador. And Mr. Kenny serves on our resident council. So what you see here is the, the ways in which we have been able to create pathways, even though we have the staff footprint on site, to create leadership and growth opportunities within the community. I showed this picture earlier. 78 guys in this picture, less than a dozen of them had a TBI diagnosed at the time. Here's two of those guys a month before we came home. They've just gotten out of this truck and you can see the truck's been crunched up like a beer can. Now, a year earlier, these Marines would have been in a Humvee and it would have been obliterated by this landmine and they both would be dead. But now we have these better vehicles, better armor, et cetera, and we can withstand these blasts. Look at the Marine in the front, right? He looks like somebody just socked him in the gut. That's the effect of the blast. There's not anything that struck this Marine. He is literally feeling the effects of the blast wave that went through this vehicle. When that blast happened, those Marines get out of the truck, 10 fingers, 10 toes all around, no blood, everybody's conscious. Okay, what do we do now? At the time, what we had available to us was, was basically the concussion screener that you got playing Pop Warner football which the Marine will pass. And then there's not anything left to do but to ask these young Marines, do we need to call in a medevac for you? Do we need to call in a bird and get you out of here? And what is Lance Corporal Draper gonna say to that? No fucking way. From a documentary perspective, they don't have any brain injury at all, let alone a Purple Heart, a uh, service-connected disability when they get out, et cetera. So now, 10 years later, you talk to these Marines and it's like, man, how are you doing? Oh, uh, you know, still living in my parents' house. I got divorced again, not really working. Man, it doesn't sound like you're doing that well. Yeah, well, I mean, I got 100% from the VA, probably for PTSD and other injuries. It's like, yeah, but what about your brain injury, man? Well, I got the 100%, so what's the point? It's like, the point is, you just told me a minute ago you had your first seizure last month. Yeah. Welcome to the Headway Program. If I have a prosthetic leg and you meet me on the street, you see the leg and right away you understand a lot. The brain injured veteran doesn't have the prosthetic leg. He doesn't often have any physical symptoms at all. And if there are any signifiers of his condition that are observable by another person, they tend to be things like inability to control his temper, uh, inability to behave appropriately in different social circumstances. These are things that cause people to say, I don't want that guy to work for me. I don't want that guy coming around our stuff. That guy makes me uncomfortable. That guy's weird. And so again, the veterans world gets smaller and smaller. Relationships fall away. The ability to build new relationships really atrophies. And so this is the antidote to that. So everything that you see here is done in a group basis. So headway participants come in Tuesdays and Thursdays. There will be some kind of morning activity, and they prepare a meal. Something goes off in our caveman brains when we break bread together in that way. So we do this daily. Then after the meal, they'll clean up, and there will be some kind of uh, afternoon activity, art therapy, music therapy. But in the midst of all of this group activity that to the individual feels like, I'm hanging out with my friends. If you watch, you're going to see the occupational therapists just subtly work their way around the room 
and make these small touches here and there. And so throughout, the dynamic of socializing and spending quality time with your friends is never disrupted. But in fact, the individual gets hours of quality occupational therapy in this group setting. So this is the Headway program. And you can see uh, the, the physical limitations we're dealing with. There are over 2,000 brain injured veterans in this city alone. And we've got 23 of them enrolled in this program. So the need is out there. But we're out of space in which to accommodate it. This 10,000 square foot facility is going to let us do two things. The first one is that it significantly increases the size available to us to run our existing programs. But the other thing that it's going to let us do, which I think is even more impactful, is this facility cannot hold any commercial tenants in it. We can't rent any of this space out because we've gotten some money from the state with which to build it. So what that is going to let us do is go to every other veteran resource provider and say, we have a space for you. All you have to do is show up. What it provides is a single physical hub for any veteran in the city to come to have their problem solved. Whether the problem is, I'm unhoused and I don't know what to do, to, man, I'm doing okay, but I'd really like to drink a cup of coffee with a fellow vet. And once we've done that, now we have something that can be replicated in the next location, in the next location, in the next location. There are piles being driven into the ground outside right now for that facility. Construction is now underway. I mean, talk about possibility and, and the things that we feel best at and strongest about. My wife and I welcomed our second daughter, Sophia Eloise Smith, into the world on August 12th. But she is uh, a little over two months old now. Uh, big sister Adele is, is loving life with, uh, with baby sister. And to be in this line of work that is so centrally focused on the building of community and, and, the, and the creation of, uh, in, a, in a very real sense, the creation of a world that's just a better one. It's just a better, kinder place where people are decent to each other. Um, you know, those are adjectives that seem to have gotten in increasingly short supply over the last few years. So to be... In, in the sort of in the front lines of reversing that trend and to be doing it in a, in a way that seems to have some real traction, um, it feels great.